Amen. Take your Bibles tonight and turn with me. I'll be not. I was going to say to the Lord's Prayer. But. <clears throat> turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. You folks know I, I beat this to death. Matthew chapter 6 is not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John chapter 17 where he prayed. What we have here before us tonight is the model prayer. And the reason we know that is because in the verses preceding where we find our text tonight, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so it's not, it's not the Son spending intimate fellowship time with the Father. It is the the son teaching the disciples how they need to pray. So it is a model prayer. And unfortunately, certain religious systems and certain peoples have uh, have let that creep into the to the church, and it's it's not right. And uh, no, I'm not on some kind of doctrinal tirade tonight to correct all the wrongs of the religious world. But there's just some things that. Well, to be honest, it just burns my biscuits. I mean, like the other day we were talking about something in the in the Bible and somebody said something about a Bible story. Church, that book is not a Bible story book. That book is, a, is God's story. It is our story. That's why we call it history, his story. Those are literal things that took place. And so instead of saying that, well, I read the story of, of Joseph today. What we need to be saying is we need to say, I read the biblical narrative about a man named Joseph today. And so what we're looking at tonight is a biblical narrative of the Lord Jesus and his disciples and him teaching them to pray. You guys know, I've told you over and over and over, and I know you're tired of hearing it, but God has, has put such a, I don't know if desire is a strong enough Adjective, burden, um, I mean prayer. We we cannot pray enough. We don't pray enough. I, I, if we did, the Bible wouldn't say in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Again, don't be bowing your head and closing your eyes when you're running down the road, please. <laughs> but you can be in a spirit, an attitude of prayer. I mean, when... When I worked in the fair ministry, people would would come in and come by, and I'd ask if they died today, they know for sure they'd go to heaven. And if they would say yes, I would say, then can you tell me how to get there? Because if I were to leave the fairgrounds right now and go to Louisville, Kentucky, I would know where I was going. Well, depending on what day it was. I might, I might not. Uh, but if I was going to, don't ask my wife about family vacations years ago, because we would just point the van in a direction and drive. We, we had no idea where we were going. We had a general idea where we wanted to end up, but we didn't know where we were going. It was so bad, one year we took my mom's middle sister with us, my Aunt Alma. After that vacation, she would never go anywhere with us again. <laughs> I think she rededicated her life at least six times on that trip. We didn't know where we were going. Uh, but anyway, so we have here in this biblical narrative, the disciples have asked, asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he tells them, to, after this manner, therefore pray. The Bible also tells us, and it slipped my mind, but the Bible tells us that we are to call no man father on this earth. So we know who this prayer is addressed to. It's addressed to God the Father who's in heaven. So let's, let's find our place here in, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. Well, let's start at verse 6. You can throw a yellow flag on the false start there. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. Jesus speaking says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Now again, that's not, that's not move your shoes over and, and push your dresses and your suits out of the way. What he's saying is you need to have a dedicated place 
where you can go and get alone with God and minimize the disruption. Maybe that is a literal closet. I know when we moved in the parsonage to tattle on Sister Vine Kilgore a little bit, her and brother Jim came to visit, and she offered to move into the master closet at the parsonage. <laughs> so I'm thankful that if I needed to, I can go in that closet and I can shut that door, and I have so much junk crammed in there that it's like a studio in there. I could get in there and shout and scream and holler and hoop and pray and cry and yell and why well, not? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about getting, I mean, come on church, you know as well as I do. You try to pray or read the word of God, the phone rings, the Jehovah's Witnesses show up at the front door, ring the doorbell. I mean, the smoke alarm goes off for absolutely no reason. Every, every conceivable interruption will happen right there at that second. Why? Because the devil knows, again, I know you get tired of hearing me say this, but he cannot make us unsaved. But if we're genuinely born again, he can render us useless. And so Jesus said, if you're going to do business with God the Father, you're going to have to get alone in a quiet place and shut the door. I heard a whole message on that phrase, shut the door. And if I could remember where I heard it, I'd steal it. Y'all know, I'm a gospel thief. I steal sermons from the best of them. Of course, most of the guys I steal sermons from have been dead for hundreds of years. Just so that somebody can't say, well, I heard so-and-so preach that. If you heard so-and-so preach some of the sermons I've stolen, we need to talk after the service because he died 200 years ago. <laughs> I'm just saying, all right, where were we? <clears throat> Squirrel. Uh, <laughs> chapter 6, verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, not if, when, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So let it be. Father, thank you for the privilege to be here now. Help us as we look into your word these, these brief few moments. Speak to our hearts, Father. I pray, God, that you would set my soul on fire for the privilege of prayer. And I pray, God, that every, every member of El Bethel Baptist Church, that you would do the same for them. Set our souls on fire. Give us a burning desire to pray and to fellowship with you in prayer. God, I pray that you'd help me tonight. You know that I'm not meet for the task at hand. Precious Holy Ghost of God, speak through me tonight. Help us to be more like Christ when we leave and when we got here. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if we're going to pray, number one, there's a requirement. He said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. You've heard me say before, when you see the word therefore, you need to know what it's there for. It literally means because of. Okay, so what he's doing is he's giving us the example. He said, after this manner, or in this way, referring to what? Proceeds or in this in this particular instance, what follows? The explanation, therefore, the the exhortation, pray ye, pray ye. Church, far too many times we we think we pray, but far too many times it's nothing more than now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to save. We don't get to prayer. We don't. Because we don't dedicate enough time to it. You say, Pastor, but I, I work 180 hours a week. Well, surrender to the ministry, and then you'll see what working all the time really is. Prayer is so important. How long do you think my wife would stay married to me if I never talked to her, if I never came home, if I never called her on the phone? 
wouldn't last very long, would it? How much more do you think it means to the Lord Jesus when we say, okay, okay, I'm going to carve out this amount of time from now until then, and I'm going to get alone in my closet, just me and Jesus. I think it thrills him. There's people when they call me and say, hey, let's spend a little time together, that I'm like, yeah. And then there's that other crowd. That they call me and go, hey, you got some free time? Uh, I think I'm painting my neighbor's cat's nails today. Uh, <laughs> it's not quite that bad. <laughs> but what a what a dishonor we do to him when we don't we don't want to spend time with him. And by the way, he tells us, here's the here's the pattern after this manner. This is the way you do it. And he doesn't say if, he says when. Secondly, in the second part of verse 9, we see the relationship. If we're going to pray and have our prayers answered, we must have a relationship with him. People pray all the time. I, I remember I remember that I did. I counseled a, uh, a fella one time, and he talked about, uh, no, it was a gal. She talked about, having a, a, uh, a near accident in Indianapolis and how she prayed. The church not only to be unkind, but the reason I got a little confused there was because she turned out to really be a deep. And that's been 30 years ago. Uh, but we have to have a relationship with him before he will answer our prayer. And even if we are his child, we have to maintain a relationship with him. And what I mean by that is we have to make sure that there's no unconfessed sin in my life or the Bible very plainly, Psalm 66, 18 tells us, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't matter if I'm his child. It doesn't matter if I'm the pastor of the church. It doesn't matter if I'm the president of the Bible college. If I'm not in a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and all of those people around me, I can forget praying because all I'm doing is wasting air. We have to have a relationship. He says, our. He's our what? Father. We have the privilege to go into the throne room of Almighty God and say, Abba, Father, Daddy. And we find that in, in the second part of verse 9. Then the third part of verse 9, we see his residence, which art in heaven. I don't understand why people want to worship people and things that here on earth. I mean, I just don't understand bowing to some statue of fat Buddha. What's he going to do for you? Nothing. That's exactly what he's going to do for you. Nothing. Which art in heaven. The God I serve sits on a throne, ruling and reigning in the hearts and lives of his people, and, and he has this thing completely under control. No matter how out of control life seems, he's still got it under control. Did it ever dawn on you that not one single solitary thing dawns on him? He knew in eternity past everything that was going to happen and it didn't phase him a bit. He's not sitting in heaven wringing his hands going, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do next. No, he's probably sitting in heaven going, that day's a day. I'm telling you. I... He knows. Why? Because he's omniscient. He knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. Nothing takes him by surprise. Not only his residence, but we see the reverence that we should have for him. In the next part of verse 9, the verse tells us, Hallowed be thy name. You all have heard the story about the little boy that went to Sunday school and he came home and his mom said, well, what did you learn today in Sunday school, sweetheart? I know God's name. And she's like, really? Thinking that must have been some Sunday school lesson. So honey, what's God's name? Howard. Howard. <laughs> yeah, our Father who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. That's what we... <laughs> That's even funnier because my grandpa, my mom's dad, his name was Howard. <laughs> Hallowed be thy name. How 
hallow. That means to make holy, to purify, to consecrate. In other words, we don't use his name vainly. We don't use his name as a cuss word. Say that in front of me as a cuss word. Little Irish spring. Wash that right out. I don't think I'd ever had my mouth washed out with soap on purpose. I think I have a couple times by accident. Hallowed be thy name. We see the request. He says, thy kingdom come. Is that not what we're looking for today? Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. Right. Yeah. But until he comes, we're to occupy church. But still, he said, this is, this is the example that he's setting for us. He said, he tells us to pray, thy kingdom come. Even though we have a lot of friends and family that need to trust Christ as their Savior, he still says it's all right to pray and ask him to, to set foot on this earth again quickly and bring his kingdom with him. Then we see the the rule, thy will be done. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is ruling. Again, none of this stuff has taken him by surprise. He knows what's going to happen. And we just need to, by faith, trust him through it all. Say, well, that's easy for you to say, preacher. You're not going through what I'm going through. No, I'm not. But I'm telling you what, just exactly what the First Lady's saying tonight, I can stand here and give you testimony after testimony after testimony that everything we've been through, he has been absolutely faithful. Yeah. Amen. Come what may. Do I want bad things to happen? No, are you kidding? No. No, I'm, I'm, ready to, I'm ready to cruise down easy streets for a minute. But if you, we get halfway down Easy Street and there's a chuck hole that knocks the front end off the vehicle, okay. We'll make it. I spared you from all of my facing the giants analogies, but I love that show. I really do. I've watched it a thousand times. And I was so excited the other day because I just want you to know I didn't have to call anybody's grandchildren. I hooked up the DVD player to our new TV. <laughs> it only took me three days and three phone calls, but I got her done. And I'm really excited about it because I watch Facing the Giants again. But one of the scenes when the coach when the coach releases the new team philosophy, he tells the boys, boys. If we win, we're going to praise him. If we lose, we're going to praise him. No matter if we win or lose, we're going to praise him. That has got to be our attitude. I'm telling you, church, there's people out there that are absolutely dumbfounded when, when life is not going our way, and we can say, well, praise God anyway. They're like, what? And maybe, just maybe, they might ask you, how are you getting through this? Well, let me tell you about my Jesus. Thy will be done in earth. Not only in earth. That's the realm. Then we see the reality as it is in heaven. Do you realize that God's will is done in heaven, period? Because there's none of us to go, well, I can do that. Oh, there, there was a group that, that rebelled. And now we have the dirty dog devil and his angels third of the angels fell in earth as it is in heaven. Then we see refreshment. Give us this day our daily bread. Verse 11. I love bread. It's been part of my downfall. So I don't eat it like I used to. 
he's talking about that literal daily bread, a loaf of bread. Church, we're so blessed. When was the last time that we actually had to sit down and pray and ask God to put food on our table? It's been a lot of years for us, I know. But we went through a we went through a summer that it was tough, and we didn't even tell our family how tough we were having. And I thank God for my cousin and his wife for their garden because I'm telling you, we ate enough tomatoes that we should be speaking Italian. <laughs> We, we lived on corn out of the garden and toast and tomato sandwiches and cottage cheese when we could afford it. But we didn't tell anybody. Why? Because he's faithful and he provides. That refreshment. Give us this day our daily bread. Here's a big one. Restoration. In verse 12 he says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Oh, I've, I've had people who, who didn't want to who didn't want to get baptized because different reasons some just shy and I always remind them that the Lord Jesus said if you won't confess me before men I won't confess you before my father and uh, mark it down. We're not going to get forgiven ourselves. It's pretty tough stuff. But I'm telling you, there's some people in my life that it has been terribly difficult to forgive. But I finally, with the Lord's help, came to the place where I could say, they're in your hands. The best I know how, I forgive them. Not everybody knows my story, and sometimes when we're not live streaming, I'll share my whole story. And it is a story of forgiveness. And by the way, that line of forgiveness comes right to the sanctuary of El Bethel Baptist Church. But because we're live streaming, I don't want to I don't want to go there and name names and all that good stuff. But we'll, we'll share that again. To forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Are we a forgiving people? We should be. Why? Because we have been forgiven. The Bible says, he who is forgiven much loves much. So let's take our spiritual temperature. If I'm if I'm head over heels in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, am, am I do I love him because he first loved me supremely? I should. I mean, there's some people that I would die for, but honestly, church, there's people out there that I'm not gonna lay down my life. Unless God says, do it. Okay. But no matter how good or bad any human being ever was, he willingly laid down his life and died for them. Then he talks about in verse 13, righteousness. He said, lead us not into temptation. You know, that used to bother me when I used to read that. Because the Bible says that God does not tempt us. In James, straight up says that, and I'm like, uh, okay. What that literally means, he's saying we need to pray that God will not lead us to a place where we can be tempted. Because he will test us, he will prove us by leading us places. He knows how we're going to respond. But we don't. I know there's been times in my life when I think, nah, that's no problem. Yeah, right. About two weeks later, boom, you fall right to it. I know of a preacher who made a very bold statement in the pulpit one time and said that there's not a woman on this earth that could cause him to fall into sin. Little did he know that there was a woman in that congregation that night, and that became her goal. They ended up in a relationship together and for 
they were they were married. I want to say it's a year, and I could be lying to you. If I am, I apologize. They were married for about a year, and she filed for divorce. And when she told him that she filed for divorce, she said, I just want you to know, at such and such a time, you said that there wasn't a woman on this earth who could take you down, and I'm her. Amen. I'm leaving you. I have been on drugs the entire year that we have been married. This thing is over. Mission accomplished, basically, is what she said. Church, we've got to be careful. We have to be careful when we get so lifted up with pride and we say, no, I would never do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you would. That's, that's another reason prayer is so important, so vital. By the way, it's listed in Ephesians chapter 6 right along with the armor. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Righteousness. Then we see rescue. And I'm going to, oh my goodness. He says, but deliver us from evil. Who, who, is, who is our deliverer? The Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power of and the glory forever. Amen. Worship. You see, we have this idea of, of what we think worship is. Now, I've, I've said it a hundred times before, but worship, when you think of worship, the easiest way to describe it is worship. If I'm going to worship something, I, I ascribe worth to it. Um, I have a, a pastor friend and I won't name his name, but uh, he used to talk about how he would worship himself in the mirror. He, he would just comb his hair and comb his hair and comb his hair. And now he don't have any. <laughs> God shares his glory with no man, woman, boy, girl, thing, whatever it is. And if we worship it, he'll take it away. Because he won't. He, he will not, he will not be usurped. In other words, he will not allow anything to take his place. I sincerely believe he will take a child of God home to heaven before he will allow that to happen. All right. So, Brother Brian, let's let's uh, let's have a, a verse and a chorus of a song. <laughs> 